uh, inviting me to come to Springfield. Thanks, Sherry, for hosting this. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about tree rings and fire anywhere, so uh, sparing my kids during this hour, I guess. Um, again, I'm, I'm at the University of Missouri, and uh, I am supervising the research at the uh, Missouri Tree Ring Laboratory, uh, one of the few tree ring laboratories in the U.S. Uh, today I'll talk about um, trends and complexity in the Great Plains, and I think this photograph from uh, Charles Russell National Wildlife Refuge in Montana really sets the stage well following a 2006 fire showing the effect of <clears throat> the Missouri River floodplain and in, in the water there in inhibiting fire, as well as the effect of uh, prairie dogs and the grazing of prairie dogs in terms of influencing the uh, complexity of fire on the landscape. And uh, I steal this from uh, two famous paleoclimatologists about uh, their uh, perspective on climate and then switch it around a little bit here and, and just insert fire and that is in order to understand how fire may vary in the future it's important to understand how it has varied in the past and with uh, such knowledge we can place our contemporary uh, fire into a longer term perspective and understand how fire may uh, vary in the future <clears throat> there's many different ways to look backwards at fire um, uh, the sources of information range from charcoal to fire scars on trees, which is my specialty. Uh, vegetation can tell you about past fires, uh, all the way up to uh, satellite imagery. Each of them have their own uh, unique kind of uh, way in which they express what is happening on the landscape. And if you can combine multiple uh, proxies, uh, the better. Uh, charcoal can go the deepest in time, 10,000, 100,000 years. However, the resolution is coarse, uh, so maybe plus or minus 100 years in terms of how accurate you can uh, identify a fire. Versus fire scars, um, they're very precise. They can span uh, centuries to millennia. However, um, you know, they, they aren't as good as, as satellites where you can uh, get uh, up to second and very good information on the spatial extent. And just in case uh, your, your education in fire history is based on the uh, far side, I thought it would uh, uh, ease your mind that I just don't go around chopping down old trees and, and pointing at injuries inside of them. There's a little bit more uh, to it than that. <clears throat> uh, dendrochronology is, it, it is a unique kind of science. Um, it allows for exact or precise dating uh, of events in the past. Um, once you have a ring uh, dated, uh, like this 1403 ring, anything that happens within that ring can be dated. So not only can you get it to a year, but perhaps even the season of the year. Uh, again, they, they span centuries to millennia. The science is about a century old. So there, there are many different scientists, many different methods that have been developed. Um, the applications, again, are many to climate, fire, people, um, and there's, there's lots of different perspectives uh, in physiology, bringing uh, statistics into it. Uh, and then lastly, I think probably uh, one of the most important things is um, it gives you an eye for time. And what do I mean by that? Much like a botanist can look at a sedge and determine what species of sedge it is, which can be nearly impossible. Um, without a lot of experience. A dendrochronologist can walk through a place and, and kind of see uh, what came first, what came second, um, what came third. You, you get the ability to interpret uh, time on the landscape, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, Um, this graph shows uh, different time scales on the x-axis, so seconds, days, and decades. And then this is space on the y-axis from microsite, wildfire, and region. We're all probably familiar with the fire triangle. 
um, where the flame relies on oxygen, heat, and fuel to exist happens over seconds and at a particular little spot. Uh, somewhat similarly is the fire regime. It happens over decades and over large regions. And instead of being oxygen, heat, and fuel, it's governed by climate, ignitions, and the vegetation. And these little circles here are feedback loops so that if the vegetation changes, uh, it will change the fire regime, and the fire regime can change the vegetation. Uh, so that's what that means. Uh, the general elements of a fire regime are um, describing what the seasonality of fires typically are, uh, the sizes, um, how complex are the patterns in the fire, are they always nice uh, elliptical uh, shapes or are they uh, amoebas on the landscape, what's the uh, amount of energy released, intensity, uh, what's the impact to the community, which means severity, and then uh, fire types. Is this a ground fire fire regime, or is this a fire regime that has running crown fires more commonly? And then lastly, probably what's talked about most is fire frequency. And I'll talk a lot about fire frequency today. So the Great Plains, just to make sure we're all talking about the same Great Plains. Of course, they, one of the largest biomes in North America um, spans about one-eighth of the U.S. And in my opinion, there's somewhat unfounded notions that uh, the Great Plains burned frequently or even uh, annually. Um, some of the major components of the fire regime, things that influence the fire regime, are listed here. Uh, precipitation. The main take home point here is that the precipitation field is mainly oriented east-west, so you get increasing precipitation as you move to the east. Kind of oppositely is temperature. The temperature field is oriented north-south, so decreasing temperature with latitude. Uh, we know very little about lightning. This is a lightning flash map, but it doesn't mean this is a fire start map from lightning. And uh, just showing you that there's increasing lightning flashes to the southeast, but again, we know very little about lightning ignition frequency. In, any part of North America over long time scales. And then lastly, wind. Wind is an a interesting factor that high wind speeds corresponding directly with the Great Plains biome. <clears throat> Other things we don't know much about, but were very important factors in the historic fire regime of the Great Plains. Certainly uh, the grazing and movement in the populations of, of bison. Uh, and similarly, uh, the populations of people. This map is uh, Driver and Massey's estimation of human population at 1500 in North America. And then this is the uh, census of 2000 census of current day. Basically uh, the, the point of this is that uh, the same relative uh, uh, pattern of human population is that uh, we occupy primarily the coastlines and that the Great Plains is generally a depopulated uh, region. <clears throat> I'm showing you all these things because all these are important factors when you talk about uh, the things that influence fire regimes over long periods of time. The Great Plains, uh, according to Knapp and others, has its is considered its own uh, kind of fire regime region. Um, they break it out as the central region and um, this is a really good publication if you haven't seen it. Uh, they describe what the historic fire regime period would have been. So this is the historic fire regime here in the uh, hatched area. And then this is where prescribed fire is happening. Uh, these are months. So prescribed fire is in April. Historic fire regime would have been summer. And then there's other prescribed fire happening uh, in the fall. And uh, it goes through different places. This would be in which, around Wichita, Kansas, saying uh, the historic fire regime was in the summer, and now we do prescribed burning primarily in the spring. Um, again, you know, very little data um, behind uh, some of these graphs. This is Cecil Frost's uh, 1998 um, estimation of pre-settlement fire frequency. I've outlined the Great Plains here. Uh, 
generally what this shows is that fire frequency, uh, according to Cecil, ranged anywhere from one to uh, about 25 years throughout the Great Plains, with this central light region having the most frequent uh, fires, anywhere from one to three years, and the northern and southern areas having the longer uh, fire intervals. Another common source of data is the land fire products. Uh, there's different wildfire products uh, provided by land fire. This is a model um, estimation of what fire frequency was historically in the Great Plains. Uh, similar to Cecil's map, uh, most of the colors are in this 35 and less uh, fire frequency range, where, where Cecil um, uh, indicated frequent fires, they have some of the longer fire intervals, anywhere from 26 to uh, 30 years. Uh, but most of the areas in this uh, less than 10 uh, fire frequency uh, value. <clears throat> uh, this is the, um, <clears throat> the International Multi-Proxy Paleo Fire Data Bank, which is a big word for fire history database held by NOAA. And these, red tri these uh, orange triangles indicate where we have fire history data. Um, and so as you can see, um, we really, there's none at this time uh, in, I believe 2009 is when I downloaded this. So most of the uh, information that is behind those maps is really based on model mo uh, expert opinion or uh, vegetation from other uh, regions. Um, so now I want to begin telling you about a study that we conducted that supported by the National Park Service to uh, try to fill in basically gaps throughout the Great Plains in the uh, fire history records. Um, and then what we wanted to do was try to use those uh, records to uh, develop a model that's based on the data frequency of fires. <clears throat> Uh, so these are the major parks, or these are the, all the park units within the Great Plains region. Um, not all of them have trees, so we can't do work at all of them. Some of them have already been studied in, in previous efforts. And so we targeted the ones that would give us um, the most uh, likelihood of, of a record that went prior to uh, settlement, because that's really what we were interested in, the historic period. The yellow dots uh, indicate where we were able to work on Park Service units and develop uh, records. So these are records at uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Devil's Tower, in <coughs> along the Niobrara River, National Scenic Riverway. Uh, Off-park properties, but in similar vegetation systems, we developed records. Uh, this is in the Charles uh, Russell National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this is uh, on some state lands in, in Nebraska uh, near Shadron. <clears throat> Scotts Bluff, just south of Scotts Bluff in the, in the Wildcat Hills. And then a site in Kansas and southwestern Oklahoma and in north um, eastern Texas. <clears throat> uh, we, uh, about the time of the initiation of this project, we had just finished two different sites on the edges of the Great Plains, one at Capulin Volcano and one in the Lus Hills uh, in Missouri at a conservation area there. Uh, and then we were involved in a project further east that has a couple sites in uh, grassland-like areas, uh, one in Iowa and one in uh, eastern Oklahoma. And then during the project, other studies were going as well. And so as you can see, uh, at the present time, there's, there's quite a lot of information about fire history uh, in the Great Plains region that can be accessed. So how do we do what we do? Um, when we go to a site, we're looking for material that can uh, both tell us about fire as well as extend far back in time. Uh, we hike around surveying the woody uh, material, live trees, down wood, old stumps. We, once we identify uh, a site, which is typically about one kilometer square, um, having adequate trees, which is usually somewhere 30 to 50 trees, uh, then we'll call that a site and we'll, we'll start collecting uh, sections uh, from, from these uh, trees, stumps, and uh,
gives us more information about uh, the fire events. Excuse me. I'm playing for three hours here. Is that okay? Uh, how, how do you form a fire scar? Well, uh, if this is a woody stem and these are the rings, when a fire burns past the tree, it often will kill a portion of the cambium indicated by this red zone. So since that is dead cambium, the, su the subsequent, subsequent rings can only grow from the living part of the tree. And the tree starts healing over itself uh, from that point each successive year. And, and eventually, it's possible for that tree to um, totally uh, you know, cover over that wound so that if you're looking at the tree from the outside, you'd never know that it was injured by a, a fire. So we do sample trees that don't have fire scars on the outside. Often they have fire scars on the inside. Uh, a different example would be, again, if you injure this tree, but then a second fire comes by uh, before the wound is closed, what that does is it holds the uh, wound open. And so you can, you can have multiple fire scars indicated uh, by these different points of where the cambium was killed back. And that's essentially what we're looking at is we're able to date that fire event based on that ring when it, the cambium was killed back uh, to that point. So how do we date it? Uh, often we go into or we have to develop a record for the site. So this is an old growth red pine forest. What we would do is we would core uh, some of these trees. We would <clears throat> develop a growth pattern from these living trees. Uh, so there, all these black lines are different trees. This red line is the average growth for that forest, okay? And so we, ha we have a master pattern that is absolutely dated perfectly in time. So then what we can do is we can cut a piece of dead wood, like a branch on the ground, an old stump. We have no idea uh, when this tree died. We measure all the rings, so we get this pattern from this unknown age of a tree. We measure all these rings. And then we pass that uh, pattern by the uh, known uh, growth curve. And then that tree will only fit one place in time. Okay? So once it's dated, then we know the exact year of every one of these uh, rings. So here's 1800, and every dot is every 10 years. Okay, so all the rings are perfectly dated, uh, and then we can then assign the years to all these injuries on this tree. All right, everybody follow me? A couple people sleeping in the back there, that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> beyond that, uh, depending on where the injury is within the ring, we can determine the seasonality within that year, okay? So if the tree grew just a few cells and then an injury happened, we know that that fire happened in the early part of the year. If the tree was far along and it was already producing this late wood, which is this darker wood, and then the injury happened, we know that the fire happened during the late summer or fall of whatever year it is, 1622. And if it happened when the tree was dormant in the fall or winter or early, very early spring, the injury is going to occur between rings. Okay. So that's how we can date the seasonality of the uh, different fires in the past. Well, this is just an example of a cross section. Uh, in the study in the Great Plains, we use two species primarily Ponderosa pine in the northern uh, plains and uh, post oak in the southern plains. Both of those species are long lived. Uh, they're fire tolerant, they're able to take a scar or 20 and keep on growing. Um, highly used in fire history uh, research. This example is from uh, Devil's Tower, a uh, spectacular piece. It died one year before I arrived. What's the chances? I really didn't cut this down. It still had brown needles and uh, uh, it has fire injuries going back to the 1300s.
Uh, this is an example of a post oak um, and a little bit different scar uh, formation, but you can see the injuries here and these are all the different years associated with uh, those fire events. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to take a tour and we're going to start up here at uh, Charles Russell and we're going to come down through like this and I'm going to show you the records um, from these Great Plains sites uh, generally from north to south. Uh, again, Charles, Russell, Russ, Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge, amazing place if you haven't been there, uh, over 100 miles uh, long east to west in um, you know relatively an unsettled landscape um, very remote uh, places the uh, Lost Creek site um, this is it basically so you know we're really interested in the grassland fire regime but we're using trees and so what we try to do is we, we try to locate these places these these forest sites within uh, grasslands or on the edges of the grasslands and our assumption was that they, the frequency of fire was ref, of the grasslands was reflected uh, at these forested sites. This is uh, Ponderosa Pine uh, Parkland. Um, <clears throat> again, it's along the Missouri River uh, headwaters. Here we are, uh, north central Montana. This is a Ponderosa Pine from that site. You can see the fire scars. Very slow growing tree. And this is, the, this is basically the data. And let me just uh, explain this chart to you. This is, these are the years, calendar years on the bottom, okay? Each one of these horizontal lines represents the uh, period of record for an individual tree. So here there's probably 30 or so trees. <clears throat> some of them are very young and some of them are old, okay? And each of these bold ticks are the fire scars on those different trees. All the fire scar years are listed right here at the bottom for all the trees at the site. Um, these vertical lines on the left side indicate the actual year that that tree uh, it germinated. Um, if they're slanted, that means they're rotten and they keep going. They're rotten on the inside and they keep going. Similarly on the outside, uh, if they're up and down, that means it was bark. If it's a vertical end or if it's slanted, it means they're it was rotted from the outside in. And then the seasonality, you can't see it, but the seasonality of all the scars are indicated just above the tick. Um, <clears throat> so let me just try to interpret this uh, clearly. Uh, so you have some trees regenerating here in the late 1600s that we sampled. Then there was a, a fire in 1702 that scarred uh, five out of six of the trees. That's a pretty high percentage of trees. There's no regenerate, and then there's no regeneration here. There's a couple other fires, and then there's a regeneration pulse uh, in a period without fire, uh, and then here's another severe fire, um, a regeneration pulse, severe fire, regeneration pulse, um, and then there are these other fires that only scar one or two trees, which we would assume are lower severity fires. So from this, uh, you know, the fire frequency is about every 16 years over this. Uh, 300 period, 300 year period, uh, and then there's different types of fires. There seems to be fires that are high severity, burning many trees in one event, and then there's other fires that seem low severity, only scarring one tree. Um, and most of these fires are all late summer at this site. Uh, this, uh, I believe 1982 was a, was a dormant season uh, fire. All these trees were killed in the 2006 fire. Um, fire. Okay, uh, we'll go to Teddy Roosevelt uh, National Park. Um, this is a very dissected landscape, dissected by uh, badlands. Uh, there are these little prairie areas, and uh, throughout, broken by more badlands and, and arroyos or, or creek areas, washouts. And this is uh, primarily. Uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper. Um, <clears throat> it was a very difficult place for us to do a fire history, uh, primarily because there wasn't a lot of woody material, and uh, this species 
uh, hasn't been used that much for these studies. However, I will show you the data. This record from Rocky Mountain Juniper goes back to about uh, the early 1500s. There was a period here in the 1600s where there were uh, five fires in about uh, six years, seven years. So very frequent fire during this little period. However, generally there's uh, a low frequency of fire. Um, I don't put a whole lot of stock in this record how, because primarily there's only uh, eight trees. Uh, could be right. I know. Uh, moving on to uh, Devil's Tower. Um, Devil's Tower is a is a ponderosa pine parkland uh, site. Uh, to the uh, west is the Thunder Basin National Grassland. So there's a large uh, grassland region uh, straight to the west. This is a, a dead ponderosa pine with a tall uh, scar face with charcoal uh, on the inside. Uh, this is one of our samples. <clears throat> and this is the uh, fire history data from, from Devil's Tower. Uh, one of the longest records we've ever made. It goes back to uh, the early 1300s. Uh, so it, you know, this record is going through many different uh, generations of people, uh, likely different cultures, many different climates, uh, and yet the interestingly the frequency of fire is fairly regular. Um, there there aren't a lot of places where you see uh, abrupt increases or really long intervals uh, spread throughout. Uh, the average fire interval or mean fire interval for the pre-1850 period, which is this period, is about 26 years. Uh, this increase in fire frequency here, anybody, anybody know what was going on in that region about that time? Lots, lots of conflict between uh, the military and the Sioux during that period. Uh, likely lots of fires re related to that conflict. And then this is uh, very common throughout North America is this lack of fire during the 1900s. <clears throat> uh, we'll move down to uh, the upper headwaters of the Niobrara River. This is West Ash Creek. It's on some prior. So change in the fire regime about 1830, 1850. Um, that is pretty common. Uh, that we would see that in like the Ozarks or in, in Tennessee. Um, interestingly, we saw that also at the Los Hills in northwestern Missouri. And so for whatever reason, uh, that mid-1850 increase in fire frequency occurs in this zone. We don't see it um, outside of that zone. Um, likely uh, effect of, of people. People either conflict, killing of buffalo, uh, likely not a climate influence. <clears throat> uh, we'll move over to Capulin Volcano. Uh, this is a cool site. I'd like to do more sites like this. You know, a forested uh, cinder cone in a sea of grass. Um, although there are lots of lightning strikes to these high elevations, I think this is a, one, a perfect situation to be able to record grassland-like fire uh, regimes. <clears throat> this site is interesting in that it's kind of flip-flop uh, of the other sites in that it has very frequent burning in the 1600s uh, up to 1700. And the types of fires are fires that only scar a few trees, right? They're not scarring lots of trees in single events. But uh, after about 1740, 1750, it changes into that kind of fire regime where the fires start scarring many trees when the events happen. Uh, there are old teepee rings at, at this site. It was definitely occupied. Uh, it's not well known when exactly it was occupied. However, it was definitely occupied and probably during this uh, period. Uh, we'll move over to uh, the Chautauqua Hills in Kansas. This is in uh, southeastern Kansas at Lazy SB Ranch. This is a private ranch. Um, this is, now we're transitioning into post oak fire histories. All the fire histories I showed you prior to this were ponderosa pine. This is a post oak uh, um, ingrown woodland. 
So it's kind of like a forest, but it obviously wasn't a forest historically. The old trees are uh, widely scattered and the young trees are just arriving and growing in, as are the uh, eastern red cedar. These are fire scars on uh, post oaks. This is a very large fire scar, smaller one. This is a interesting fire scar here. Caleb sticking his head through. <clears throat> this fire history doesn't go that far back into time. It's uh, you know fairly well replicated with maybe 20 trees back to about 1875, 1860. Uh, <clears throat> But most of the fire histories in this part of the world show moderate frequency, like every five to ten years prior to settlement. Uh, I think this is this is just awesome. This really, I think, records what we all know about the Flint Hills and in this part of Kansas is that it's burning. It's actively burning. It has an active uh, fire regime um, caused by people burning, and interestingly. I wonder if it's not burning more frequently now than it has in the last two or three hundred years. I don't think that's a very popular statement. Um, off to the Wichita Mountains. This is in the southwestern portion of Oklahoma. It's a little mountain range uh, there. Um, <clears throat> we've actually done four different fire histories in four different places of that refuge. Uh, some of them are, are very um, uh, bound by big grassy uh, um, plains. Others are tucked in in more of an oak woodland kind of setting into some rougher topography. However, if you look at all four of them, they all share uh, kind of common features, particularly this in increased fire frequency uh, in the 1850s to 1860s period. So often we get the question is how, how applicable is this data to larger expanse. And in some time periods, it's not applicable. But however, in others, there are certain things that happen over large extents, like this increase in fire frequency in the, in the 1850s. Uh, some of the sites show uh, post-1900 fire suppression. However, some of them don't. Uh, this area is in the actually in the larger plains area that is a tr major travel corridor, and it maintained uh, some level of fire in the 1900s. Uh, in general, the average fire frequency here was about every five to six years prior to 1850, which is when a lot of Europeans came into this area. In, on the post oaks, these are, I think, all dormant season scars. So these would have been, um, you know, probably late August all the way into, into March. We don't really know exactly when, um, but they were dormant season. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, this is from... Uh, Purtis Creek State Park in uh, northeastern Texas. Uh, it's adjacent to the Blackland Prairie. Uh, this is a, a post oak or sand post oak uh, savanna. Um, has a really nice uh, herbaceous grass component in the uh, fuel bed on the on the floor still, even though it hasn't seen fire for uh, you know over 80 years, um, and it has a very interesting fire regime, right? This is uh, this is a forest that has 315-year-old trees and 150-year-old trees, and that's pretty much it. Uh, there aren't a lot of trees in between. Why not? Well, there was a lot of fire during this period, so there aren't any trees getting established. Once that fire stops, this cohort of trees establishes, and then. Um, there was other uh, fires here that's not really known why these fires occurred, but very frequent fire um, prior to 1850, and effectively fire suppression happened here very early compared to most other parts of the eastern U.S., as early as 1850. <clears throat> okay, just try to talk about a little bit about uh, some of the trends that we see. In terms of seasonality, it appears that uh, some of the western and northern, what, nor northwestern regions lend themselves to indicating more summer seasonality compared to the southern plains, which lend themselves to say more dormant season. Um, unfortunately, uh, I can't tell you much more detail than that, even, even though people want to know, is it October or is it February or when is it? The trees really aren't 
good at bearing that out in terms of what is dormant season in the southern plains. Uh, fire severity, you know, generally there it seems there's um, greater likelihood of higher severity fires in those ponderosa pine uh, like systems in the north compared to uh, what we see in the post oak uh, areas. Uh, obviously, if you have trees going back three, four hundred years, none of the fires are totally replacing right, the canopy because there are trees uh, being recording fires. So, uh, so it's interesting whenever you, you go to a site, and like you may see in Missouri or in Oklahoma or in, in, in Montana, and, and a fire occurs that kills everything. Um, in, in some of these really old, uh, you know, stands that have evidence of fire, that is very, very uncommon for us to, uh, to see indications of, of, of those types of fires. <clears throat> it's possibly, it's, it's, it's a problem with the data, I'm not sure. Uh, often uh, we see increased fire with uh, European, uh, Euro-American settlement, that's uh, EAS there. Um, however, uh, I think it's interesting, we didn't see a lot of that effect in Charles Russell and some of those very remote places that aren't uh, really settled by uh, towns and, and other farms. Um, so you know, if that is maybe a lightning regime, it's still uh, going on. As well as uh, the unique uh, you know, fire uh, use in other areas such as the uh, Flint Hills. <clears throat> so prior to yeah, Trinity. So the, probably the most stark um, you know, trend in the data is this last bullet point here, is that if you look at all the data from the north to the south, which is you know, from a colder generally region to a warmer region, that fire, the frequency of fires are increasing uh, with temperature. And if you plot the average fire return interval by that place's mean maximum temperature, it, it falls out uh, kind of like this. So it seems that uh, you know the, a broad trend is that the, the temperature of that region is influencing the rate at which those fires can happen on that landscape. <clears throat> uh, complexities, uh, many. Uh, Although the Great Plains are maybe a, a topographically, you know, smooth and in, in, in the in the precip is nicely, you know, uh, grading east to west and temperature north to south. Uh, each site has its own unique um, history of fire. Now there may be a trend from north to south. However, if you look at the temporal sequence of fire and the types of fire and the seasonality to that depth of each site, each site is um, different. Um, so it's, it's difficult to generalize what we know about this area, let's say, in, in one Ponderosa pine uh, stand, and take that information and take it over and try to understand another. Um, that, the reasons the vegetation are similar or not, um, it may be very difficult to use the fire regime of one place to, to uh, put that on another site. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and, and those differences are likely due to changes in ignition types, maybe from, from being one that's dominated by human ignitions to one that then goes over to a lightning-dominated uh, ignition type. Uh, certainly changes in, in human cultures and the numbers of people are important to uh, regulating fire frequency. And then we know very little, I think, about uh, some of the other uh, modifications that humans have uh, caused, such as extirpation of, of bison and, and other species uh, in that effect on, on the fire regimes. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to especially thank the National Park Service. Uh, they funded uh, all of this work pretty much, except for the other si additional sites. Um, the Joint Fire Science Program, they've, they've given us uh, lots of different funding over, this, over the years to do fire history throughout the eastern United States. Uh, the University of Nebraska was a, was a partner on this project. And then all these other folks uh, offered up their lands for us to uh, do these studies. <clears throat>